So um, now it's over to you, ladies and gentlemen, for um, uh, a question and answer session. And I'd like to um, invite to the stage uh, David and Simon, whom you've met, but also three other uh, senior people from Urban Growth New South Wales, and they are Alex Vella. Um, Alex has been the project manager in charge of the actual transformation plan discussion paper. Uh, Paul Hurrigan, who's, in, who's a senior manager in charge of uh, operations at the Bays Precinct. And also Julian Frecklington, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Urban Growth New South Wales. So we've got, uh, we've got at least a good half an hour, maybe even more, for questions. But um, I'm really keen for uh, everybody to get an opportunity to, uh, to ask a question. So just the usual protocols will apply. Um, if you are to ask a question, could you say your name and the organisation that you're from? Uh, just because we are quite a large group, if we could limit the question to one question um, uh, and then perhaps we can rotate back later. Uh, if people want to make statements, I think there is the opportunity to do that later on in the open mic session. So if you are to make a statement prior to asking a question, perhaps make it very brief. And one other little protocol that it would be good if we could adopt, just in the interest of transparency, if you do have uh, either a financial or personal interest in any outcome that might arise out of the base precinct, if you could declare that, just, uh, just so everybody is, is clear. So, over to you, ladies and gentlemen. Who, uh, who has a question? Please, sir. Uh, my name is, uh, There's a microphone coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is David Springett from the Bayes Community Coalition. Um, I'd like to have the panel talk about where does um, sporting bodies and uh, schools and hospitals, where does that fit? Does it fit in the employment? Does it fit in the public realm or the housing? It doesn't seem to be a neat fit into any of those areas. Over to you. Good question. Perhaps you, yeah, I'll start. David? And yeah. uh, actually get contributions from the others. The answer is that we're looking for um, an overall mix of things that include all of the things that you've just spoken about, David. The public realm would include the schools and the, and, and the notion that we have in relation to the schools that we would uh, align the, the any uh, dealings that education have with the production of sporting fields that are publicly uh, available. You know, the, the model in Australia is quite widely that you close the school at the end of the day and you lock the gates and no one can use them. We want to go down much the more the the European process where the school becomes the public um, after hours, so that's one element of it. We are looking for whether there's a working hospital, um, we're uncertain just at this point, but we are certainly looking to consider the possibility of international standard health research uh, and R&D uh, uh, places. I don't know whether you're familiar with what's gone on in Roosevelt Island in New York, but you know, that the possibility exists for that whether that's a teaching hospital or whether it becomes a, an operational an operating hospital we've yet to determine it but we're very open for what mix of industry um, industry and research and uh, and the operations that go with it are and um, anyone else like to comment maybe maybe from some of the others that haven't spoken julian um, Look, ultimately we are trying to create a knowledge intensive hub that drives economic performance and needs to be on the right side of, um, I guess, the transition to a knowledge economy. So we need smart people, we need talent, and we need to create talent over a 30 year lifetime because that's, just, that's the, the time the project's operating. So education and schools and the opportunities to provide primary, secondary, tertiary, and then ultimately research is absolutely fundamental if we're going to achieve the ambition for this precinct. So it's something that's not lost. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. It, 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 it's in that core of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, but I think it was a valid question that you raised in terms of fitting within one of those buckets. Thank you. Next question. Lady over there. Yeah, there's a microphone coming to you. Thank you. Tina Clerk. Um, I'm from the Bayes Community Coalition, but also I'm the chair of the Leichhardt Residents Precinct Committee. I've raised the question at the summit, and I was told to shut up about West Connex. Now you appear to be um, open to community consultation, you want us to give us your big ideas. Nobody's talking about doing that for West Connex. Now I want to know, does urban growth have a position on that and is there going to be some say that the public have about whether or not West Connex actually goes there? Because you and I know that if West Connex does go in there in terms of an interchange, it's going to leave precious little space for anything much else in the railway, in the, rail, the Roselle rail yards. So what is 
Like, is it a done deal? Are we going to have open community consultation about West Connex? And what's the process for that? David. I'm not sure who told you. I'm not sure, Tina, who told you to shut up at the summit last year, but. Uh, sorry? I don't think it was. Okay, right, okay. The situation in relation to West Connex, and I know that there's a lot of concern broadly about this project, but the, the truth of the matter is it's not our project and it's not within our operating space. Uh, and you'll, you'll say, he would say that, wouldn't he? But I don't have uh, control over the project. I do have um, some degree of influence in, re in respect to it, and I'm trying to influence very strongly what the design elements might be for West Connex and its location here. Uh, and also the, the light rail stabling yards, which is something that's come to our attention since the summit last year, uh, and that needs to be accommodated there as well. But I've got no power to say what should be there. But, uh, sorry, I've got no power to determine what should be there. I do have some rights, and so does our organisation, of influence, and we're in trying to influence the hell out of it. But I can't speak for the project. I don't have authority to do that, and I don't have authority to do what you've asked me to do. I'm sorry. Okay, next question. Gentleman down the back, there's a microphone on its way to you. Thank you. Hi there, David from Bike Sydney. Sorry for the reverberation. Sorry, a bit of echo there, yeah. yes. I'll try and judge the distance. The Thank um, you. Glebe Island Bridge seems an incredibly conspicuous absence from this project. And the, the remit of the um, project boundary seems to neatly excise it. Uh, so West connects another. What of the Glebe Island Bridge, and particularly, by the way, in the context of the trip generators that is the city and all the destinations, as you call them, um, there's going to be a lot of walking and cycling demand that won't, won't want to have to do the loop around over to Anzac Bridge into the city. It, it just seems implausible that Glebe Island Bridge isn't talked about. Paul? Thank you. Hello? Yep. Thank you very much. Glebe Island Bridge is an integral part of the project. However, the determination of what happens with Glebe Island Bridge really needs some thinking about what the area is going to become. So at this point in time, with regards to the traffic and mobility assessment we will be doing, it'll include looking at Glebe Island Bridge as it will include looking at other alternatives, i.e. the Blue Highway, the harbour, or you know, light rail capacities and the like. So Glebe Island Bridge, yes, it is part of our, our remit, we're looking at it with our, with our other agencies, so with Transport for New South Wales and with RMS, and, and it will need more thinking about what the final outcome of it is, including the relationship that it has with maritime users. Thank you. Yep, please, David. I mentioned before what the call for, go call for good ideas is all about. Sorry, did you hear yeah, it's that? On I, now. Yeah, I mentioned before what the, the call for good ideas is all about. Seems to me that the opportunity exists for you to say exactly what you just said. Yes, lady over there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Moira Sheehan and I'm from the Bays Committee Coalition, but I live in Annandale, so I guess that's a personal interest. Um, my question is again, and I think it goes to influence, because the planning laws in New South Wales currently um, allow for development under different zonings and then a development comes in and you know the bills are paid and the things are done, etc. But right to the side is that public infrastructure that David raised earlier, the social stuff, the schools, etc, etc, sits to the side. It, it was a complete you know, problem up in Piermount because nothing was done and now there's a crisis. The schools are all already full. The childcare centres don't exist. And people, Australians, I was told earlier in the 80s that Australians and units don't live in, with kids don't live in units, not that normal, that'll change, um, as it has. So again, it's the question of, there is a, a, a separation of planning and the budgets for schools and the planning processes sit over there and the childcare ones sit over here. What will you be able to do to pull all of those together so we actually get a result that is a vibrant, thriving community with all the elements that go to what this gentleman said earlier in terms of the new knowledge economy? Good question. Good question. David, can I take that? Yeah, there's a bit to that question. I'll deal with the independence of planning and, um, and the role of urban growth first, if I may. It's absolutely vital that the independence of us as the proponent for whatever goes on at the base is independent from 
the uh, consent authority, if it's the Department of Planning um, and, and Environment or if it's indeed one of the councils. So that independence is going to be preserved no matter what. We are not going to determine our own way forward. And I can see some people smiling and nodding heads. Um, and again, you'd say you would say that, but that's going to be the way it is. Um, and the reality will be enforced. Um, in relation to, Julian, you might like to respond to this and then Paul, in relation to the planning. Uh, and Alex, you might have a go as well. Uh, if I can go first, in, relationship, in, in relation to the needs for social benefits and social needs, whether it be schools, education, whether it be social facilities, childcare, whether it be active sporting fields and active uses, whether, and as we've described, the promenade is part of that. We recognise that's very important to any outcome. And, and when I say we, I mean the, the, the greater we, not just urban growth, but I think yourselves. Um, we look at you know, how we, as a group, could create the best place for Sydney as a whole. And as part of that, that must include all those social benefits. Because one of our you know, core objectives for the base is social benefit. And part of that means open space, active and passive. It means the community facilities. It means those, those childcare centres and the likes. Because we're not particularly, this is going to be a very dynamic project that runs for many years and it will go through a number of iterations and we will need that flexibility as people change lifestyles, move into apartments, move out of apartments and the likes. So I hope that helps. If I could add, if I could add to that as well, one of <coughs> Urban Growth's um, core objectives is collaboration and collaboration, which is exactly what we're, we're doing tonight, but collaboration also across government and to take the time to think about how we can work closely with our sister agencies to address all these issues in a collaborative way. Um, <clears throat> by doing that, you then get the interface that you need between the dialogue to arrive at solutions that respond to education and childcare needs, the transport mobility planning group that David touched upon, the planning coordination group that David touched upon. Those groups to help you in the thinking phase allow you to address some of those needs that we need to respond to if we're going to have a successful community created here over the next 30 years of the project life. Hello. Hello. If I could add to that, um, a part of the thinking that went around um, the development of the discussion paper that you're seeing here today. If I could encourage you to look at in the library, we have a paper on critical considerations, so 21st century critical considerations. And one of the things in actually in the centre of the discussion paper that you have is about lifelong learning. And that is some of the elements that you had talked about, the childcare, the schools, but also the, the collaboration that occurs across um, the the communities and so on and beyond that. So we are looking at wanting to uh, look at a lifelong learning platform. So we're looking at that quite early in the piece. Lady in the second row, thank you. Thank you, my name's Elizabeth Alenius and I'm from Piermont Action. Um, of partic one particular area, area, well I'm not sure whether it's area one or area two, destination one or destination two, relates to the Bank Street foreshore. Um, we've been working together with a lot of other residents um, with various governments, various government agencies, etc., etc., for 11 long years. Um, Alex Greenwich, our local member, took up our, uh, some of our concerns about finally getting the foreshore park that we've been promised since 20, 2004. Um, and to my astonishment, um, a copy of the letter from Carolyn McNally, Secretary of the Planning, New South Wales Planning and Environment Department, reveals that the government has established an interagency committee chaired by Mr. Les Willinger to develop a vision and strategic plan for the Sydney Harbour foreshore. And this has been put up as a reason why we can't do anything about our foreshore park. Through this process, consideration will be given to your ideas for this foreshore land. 
I am very confused. Can you please tell me, is urban growth developing a plan for Bank Street or is it this new interagency committee? Does it have, I was advised by phone that it sat above the urban growth base precinct planning process, but I really have not, despite all my efforts, been able to get anything in writing from anyone from the Department of Planning explaining exactly what the role of this committee is vis-a-vis -vis urban growth. Can you help me, please? Sounds like one for you, Mr Pitchford. Thank you. I'd love to help. I'd also love you to give me the letter, if you would. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I'll get it from you, if I may, because the, the, whatever Les Wittlinger has been asked to do, it is not to look at and lead the transformation of the bays. We have a cabinet instruction uh, uh, that sets us as the lead agency. What I think um, Les Wallinga uh, is doing, and I don't know exactly, because we're not, um, uh, his operation is not linked to ours, uh, it, but I think he is looking at the, um, the elements of the Schiffer land and other elements of bringing uh, some government departments together. But we will respond to this uh, as follows. I'll take your letter and I'll talk to the Secretary of Planning and I'll sort it out and I'll give you some advice about it and we will take on your ideas as part of the whether we can include it in the planning for the promenade or not but come to an agreement on what, th what that might look like. So we'll embrace your idea, see if we can fold it into our, our thinking so it becomes the overall thinking and I'll sort out with um, Les Wallinga uh, just what it is. Um, he, I'll find out what his intentions are and I'll also sort it out with planning. Good, thank you. It's the lady behind. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jane Marceau, I'm a local resident in White Bay. Um, I'm, interested in, I'm interested in process. Um, you have some very good ideas for what you call destinations. Almost all those ideas are actually the community's ideas. Um, and I don't see much recognition of that, nor do I see um, any real participation in this. And we were given this this evening as we walked in. Um, I think you need to do better than that. I think you need to think much more carefully and tell us very soon how exactly you plan to have the community participate in all of this not just consult, not just have great ideas. I bet you the great ideas are almost all the great ideas that you've already got. Um, we need to be involved in how this is going to happen and how you propose to link the residents and the interests of the residents in what's happening. Now, I, when I looked at what you were saying and what's in here, you can see that you're, as it were, adding on uh, 100 metres around the harbour, which doesn't really have any relationship to the local community. Unlike many of the community's ideas, it doesn't actually connect to Balmain or to Roselle or to Annandale or to any of those places. It's like kind of plonked down in the middle. And I think we really need to be very careful. Um, and I think you need to tell us very soon what mechanisms urban growth plans to use over the years to make that connectivity, to ensure the community is, participates in the decision, not just post-it notes and consultations, and how conflicts of interest will be uh, adjudicated. You, there's lots of lovely language in this document, but there's nothing about the practicalities of it. And I think after all these years, and we've been at it since 2006, we need some practicalities. We'll take that as a, as a statement, and I'm sure David and the team take that on, on board. Um, you, Jane, have known about the process towards the um, transformation plan for some time, and you've accused us of not engaging. Uh, I'm not going to uh, enter into a, a debate about that, but uh, I'm disappointed to hear what you've said. We've tried to engage at a, a, on a range of levels across the last six months. This whole thing tonight is part of that. You, I know you can shake your head, but I'm telling you I'm disappointed that you have this view. 
um, because we are genuinely trying to do something about reaching and engaging. We've given you what our thoughts are. We've given you six weeks to consider what you think they are. And if you've been on this for 2000, since 2006, it seems to me that that's a reasonable period for you to be able to respond. So I'm disappointed that you feel that way. Um, uh, I, all I can do is to reiterate my uh, words uh, previously that this is a genuine process that we're wishing you undertake. And if you don't believe that, well, I'm sorry, I'm not, this, I can't convince you otherwise, but we will tell you what the outcomes of this consultation are and we will fold the outcomes of what goes on at this summit uh, and what went on at the previous summit into the draft, uh, sorry, into the plan that we present to the government. And, uh, and there will be a range of consultations and discussions and, we come, and, and as Alex said before, we're very keen and, and um, uh, open to coming and sitting down with you about any of it. So from where I sit, I don't know what else we can offer in terms of a genuine process. You said you're concerned about process. I will do anything to try and overcome the concerns that you've just outlined. But what, about, what is it about what we were doing that you don't like so much. I mean, because we, from where I sit, I can't think of anything we haven't tried to engage. Well, we, di we discovered about the program for this evening three or four days ago. We received a communication last night asking us to make a speech. That's 24 hours in advance with no context. We have not actually had any discussions and serious community consultations over the last six months. There's a very inadequate summary of the International Summit, which is actually extraordinarily difficult to find on your website. And I don't, I mean, I've had a conversation briefly with, with you and others and with Alex and Anna, but they were conversations. We haven't got a mechanism in place for having the community involved in the way in which you are thinking. And, <laughs> I don't know how to express it more clearly, but that is how the community feels, that you are there, we are expected to trust you, and we don't have a mechanism in place for automatic discussion between community representatives and urban growth. And that the International Summit, that was one of the main things that was um, important, was considered important by people. It might be a good idea to take some of your ideas about better engagement, um, Jane, uh, offline with um, with perhaps Alex, and see if we can if we can come up with a solution that that is uh, is more to what you have in mind, because I think you know really this um, uh, the purpose of tonight was to discuss the discussion paper um, just in terms of introducing it and introducing the process until June 30 to, um, to be able to respond to it. But if that's been misunderstood, um, uh, I guess we apologise for that. Okay, over there. Thank you very much. Look, uh, thank you for putting this on tonight. Um, I, I'm certainly one that appreciates that we've been given so much access and things like that to communicate with you. Look, I just want to ask you, you're saying about a 30-year plan. Well, that's good and it's, it's important, but I'd like you to think about a 100-year plan rather than just a short plan that you seem to have yourselves in a box right now. And my concern about that is that we, as, as, a, as a society and as a species, uh, we're having a problem with the way we're treating our planet with carbon footprints and, and the damage we're doing to the environment. And I'm leaning to a particular focus here, is that our good friend, the White Bay Power Station, is one of those worst sites that would, was one of the biggest polluters ever created by humans. Now, it sits there idle, and my idea and the principles I've been leaning out to in the last three to five years is that that site is perfect to look at the next hundred years and how we manage energy. Energy is what keeps this planet going, keeps human beings going. We're going to have to learn how to handle this, this monster, and we're going to have a, need a forum and a focus point in which to do it. And the proposal I've put together is a long-term proposal about turning it into a renewable energy centre. Now, the concept simply means that it's a focus point for how people can create and invent things, where it can be, you can see it, education, it answers all the boxes, ticks all the boxes, Simon, you said about innovation earlier. David, it answers your statement earlier about um, looking for something that is unique. Nowhere else in the world do we have a, an innovation centre for, for energy management and energy renewal and things like this. And I want you to consider the 100-year plan rather than the 30-year plan when you deliberate about what opportunities White Bay offers 
uh, power station offers to your community and I'd like your thoughts on that. Sounds like a great idea to me. Response from the team, Alex? Would you like me to have a go? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely excellent comments and, and you've actually highlighted something that's uh, really important and is dear to our heart is that these transformations are life cycles and there is no end to these and 100 years is absolutely an appropriate thing to be thinking of in, in terms of places and as they're changing. In terms of the infrastructure and um, energy, um, they were absolutely very good points because White Bay Power Station did power the railways and did power and did provide energy. So some of the things that you will see in there is that we are wanting to look at in terms of world class and excellence in um, energy management as well as can the bays actually export energy to other parts of Sydney? Can it actually do something quite unique in that way? I don't know, but you sound like you have some brilliant ideas. Please use the great ideas process because that will help inform what we're thinking. Thank you. Paul, did you want to add something to that? Okay, cool. Gentleman in the second back row there. John Brooks from the Black Bottle Cave Coalition. I'd like to ask a, general, um, a genuine question. Um, this document we've got tonight gives the impression that come June 30, that's a cutoff as far as uh, communication with the community is concerned. And that's one of our deep concerns. Now, what I'd like to do is get some feedback from you as to what happens beyond June 30 that involves us, because that is not clear. And it's one of those bits of skepticism we all have because we've been there so often. I'll take that one as well. Um, today is the start of a journey, and it's the start of a journey for the people here and, and, a, and a vast number of Sydney siders. And the conversation doesn't end in the 30th of June. It's just, it's a milestone. And the conversations will continue in, in July and beyond. And so um, there'll be more information around that, but they don't just stop at the 30th of June. Entry. Entry. Um, can I just then request that we get reasonable notice? Um, in this room are a lot of very busy people. I know you are, but a lot of very busy people, and we have to plan our time. So can I just make that request? Sounds a very reasonable re request. Yes, lady in the second row there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for um, this evening. Um, Christina Ritchie from the Balmain residential area and a member of the Bayes Community Coalition. Um, my question is related to the fact that you're putting in housing in most of the areas you've talked about this evening. I'd like to know when and how you intend to engage with the community that currently surrounds the Bayes precinct and discuss the needs of the growing a high density residential area that already exists and is growing and together with the needs of any future residents you put into the Bayes precinct because you haven't discussed that tonight it hasn't been mentioned about the needs of community and a growing fast growing community and one other um, supplementary question um, if it's okay and that's related to the White Bay cruise terminal I see that you mentioned on the slide, well, it, it's related to needs of the community, in that at the moment the Balmain community is suffering from the impacts of the cruise terminal, and I, I want to know how you intend to push the Port Authority of New South Wales into action. This is an urgent matter. People are suffering really badly. There are needs within the community now that have to be addressed. And I'm concerned that you're linking uh, solutions to the cruise terminal problems with possibly future development of White Bay. Simon, yeah. Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, so th the document that we've gone through tonight is really uh, talking about the possibilities uh, to commence the discussion which is what we're doing here. So there's going to be a lot more interaction, not only over the next six weeks at some planned events, 
right, and some workshops. But ongoing after that, as Alex actually talked about, when we start to get to a level of resolution as to what the solutions could be. Remember one of the points that I actually talked about is properly understanding the transport and mobility plans. Because whatever um, solution we come up with, we need to have a transport solution and that transport solution will take into account the surrounding catchments, which is what your point is, and the surrounding catchment needs, and then what are the opportunities within the parcels of land that we're actually talking through, and then we'll go through the community consultation process associated with those areas. So hopefully that addresses your first query. The second one, with respect to uh, the cruise terminal and the issues that are associated with the cruise terminal, I, um, I know ports are actually looking at the particular concerns right, and they're trying to address those. What we've actually put forward is the opportunity to be able to try and actually assist in that process. So it's very early days in our discussions with ports, so I don't want to talk about what the specific answers are that ports have been working on, but what I'd like to do right, is actually talk about, well, maybe the linkage for the provision of um, what the needs are to solve the problems could be linked into a bigger picture solution. Somebody raised the issue or that the 100 year plan. And the trouble with us always talking about, you know, is it a 20 year job or a 30 year job? Right, it starts to, to create a level of expectation. Right, all we've tried to do is say, if we're thinking about specific areas, why don't we try and solve some of the adjacency issues at the same time? Lady in the uh, purple cardigan, thank you. Hi, Mary Mortimer from the Council of Ultima and Piermont Associations, and I'm a Piermont resident. Um, it's interesting to hear people talking about 30-year plans and 100-year plans. I'd like to talk about the next 12 months, and I'd like to ask a question about whether the community's promise of a park on that Bank Street site is in any way in your sites um, as an immediate project. The in international experts at the, at the summit, which I was privileged to attend and had some fantastic ideas, um, talked a lot about doing temporary things to engage the community and to get the community's confidence. The children who were 10 or 12 in 2004, when that park was first promised, are probably not so interested in kicking a ball around on the harbour foreshore now. There are children living in that precinct who have no open space, no access to the water, no green area in which to kick a ball or sit and look at the water. Um, and the community has a well-developed plan which has been raised with RMS, with the City of Sydney. We have all kinds of understandings that yes, it's going to happen sometime. But those children and those families can't wait even the four years that you're talking about for development of Destination One, it would be possible to do something quite quickly as a temporary thing, as a meanwhile project, which has been talked about, but we don't yet see, are there any plans to implement any of the meanwhile projects, any of the kickstarts, any of the immediate engagement with the local community to give them the confidence to believe that something's going to happen before their kids grow up and get married. Simon? You want to answer? Hello. Thanks, Mary. Look, yes, the mean miles are definitely on our, on our focus. And yes, all the parks and the ideas that you've got, we didn't, you know, obviously we know of the park. We've had a number of discussions. Um, and we'd like you to reinforce that in the call for ideas. Simon, Simon referred to earlier some of the temporary, permanent and the relationships along Bank Street and along the private owners there, the fish markets and obviously bridge down the down the uh, the northern sorry the southern end of Blackwater Bay, um, we'll be looking at all those and involving yourselves in that discussion as part of some of the workshops to try and evaluate what we can do very quickly, and what some great outcomes would be, either temporarily or permanently, um, and that relates to both the water and the land. So obviously we've got to deal with you know, land access and water access whether it be for dragon boats, whether it be for um, the current wharfs that are down there. So yes, they are on, yes, the answer is quite simply, 
Yes, it's on our agenda. Yes, it's, a, it's one of those great ideas. And yes, we'll be you know, having further discussions. There's no guarantees, but we'll be going through that process with you. Okay. We were really supposed to conclude um, about now to move to the open mic session, but I don't want to, uh, to leave anybody with a question unanswered. So is everyone happy if we just keep going and, and push the open mic sessions to a bit later? Is that okay? Good, thank you. Yes, gentleman with the lanyard on. Yep. Hi everyone, um, uh, Alex Greenwich and I'm the, the member for Sydney. I, I have a question uh, particularly about the markets plan uh, and the housing plan there. Is there any indication what density of housing we're talking about? As you would all know, Pemon is already the most densely populated part of, of the country. So I was just wanting to get a, it, it's sort of a two dots for focus and I wondered what that translates to um, into, into density perhaps. Simon? Yep. That's me. But, um, no. There isn't an answer with regard to housing density. We just saw it as an opportunity. All right, so we've identified it there as a possibility that could be explored. Uh, could I also just go back to the prior question as well? I think it's a good opportunity. I don't know the details that much, but as David said earlier, he was gonna get a copy of the letter, so it'd be good to just better understand it and see if we can actually see it as an early win. Sorry. Good. Yes, lady next to Alex, thank you. Jenny Green, uh, Councillor of the City of Sydney. It was good to see that you had affordable housing uh, detailed up there, but I'd really like to know what targets you might have at this stage. We know at Barangaroo it was about 2%, which is way below what it should be. Uh, affordable housing is critical, as we all know, right now in Sydney. So what targets are being projected? Yep, Simon? Oh, that's great. Uh, no one asked me any questions earlier. I'm getting a few now. Uh, there is no target that's actually set. As David referred to, our real focus uh, is all about housing diversity. One component of uh, housing diversity is affordable housing. There is no doubt there will be affordable housing uh, within this project. We haven't set a percentage. Uh, we don't have a view with regard to a percentage. We're going to spend a lot of time consulting with councils and uh, key stakeholders and we'll work out what's the right answer. And I think David mentioned uh, last night uh, in the conversation uh, that both the Bayes project and the Central to Everly project uh, interconnect with each other as well. So maybe there's some really clever things that we can actually do with regard to the provision of a broader uh, housing diversity response across the both projects. Um, yeah, good evening. Jamie Parker, member for Balmain. Thank you everyone for coming along this evening and thank you to Urban Growth for putting this on. Uh, I have obviously had a discussion with you um, yesterday about a lot of these details, so I won't go through it in, in uh, again, but obviously I've expressed my concern about a whole range of issues. I just wanted to ask two very related issues. First of all, the bays obviously include the marine environment, and we haven't really spoken about that. Um, we've spoken about the land environment, but we know that the marine environment is very significantly degraded, and I didn't ask this question yesterday, but to what extent does urban growth have authority to help improve not only our land-based environment but our marine environment and just very quickly what is your definition of affordable housing uh, because people talk about it but the statutory definitions there's small buildings that, that are affordable because they have a small footprint so the marine environment and the affordable housing issue please Paul for marine environment thank you Jamie um, with regards to the marine environment we recognize that more than 50 more than you know 94 hectares, there's more water there than what there is land. And as part of our process, we are very aware, and, I've, and I know I've spoken to you about it, the relationship between the land and the water. We do focus on the land. We're land-based people. We're land-based animals. We forget about that opportunity that what the water presents, whether it be for transport and mobility, whether it be for recreation, or whether it be for other purposes. And when I talk about that, we'll need to work with multiple agencies, RMS as one of, our, one of our partner agencies, to work through 
the water quality issues, the reuse issues, and whether you know whether there's a possibility of returning it to what it was in the past, and whether you know, as Simon alluded to in um, a medium term, making it the playground it was. You know, years ago people swam in there. What can we do to re improve it so as that people are not fearful of doing the same anymore? So it's very much on the agenda, and we'll be doing the same based environmental studies that we do on land as what we will be doing in the water and trying to improve both scenarios. Affordable housing? I, I can answer that. Um, so we're talking about um, uh, salary bans from 40 to 90,000, which is the traditional uh, definition. Right, that uh, we're working to for the affordable housing component. What you mentioned, uh, Jamie, was also uh, part of our uh, housing diversity strategy, which is you know exploring other really clever things as well, like you know compact apartments and smaller housing solutions that can be done in parallel with the more traditional affordable housing solutions that I think most of us understand. Rochelle. Hello, Rochelle Porteous, Mayor of Leichhardt. Um, look, I've got a couple of questions. Hopefully they'll be quite fast. And thank you, first of all, for this evening. I think it's a good start and I hope that taking on board the issues that have been raised tonight, we're going to see a good consultative process moving forward. But I guess one of my concerns is that when you look at the timeline that you presented in your documentation, John pointed out previously that it stops at... June 30th. It does actually go to September, but it does seem to stop then in September. And I guess uh, where you say that um, that's the starting of the planning process, uh, I guess uh, maybe a good question to ask is when are we going to start to see development applications actually being lodged? Because I think we need to understand what's, you know, what is going to happen after September. When are we going to see concrete proposals being put forward? When can we start talking about targets for p affordable housing, targets for open space, when are those, because at the moment we're looking very high level and I think we all like some of the ideas but it's very hard to engage in that, that wasn't short at all was it, sorry. <laughs> the other question I have and this is a great concern of me and I've really realised tonight more about that is this issue about the great ideas which sounded like a great idea to start with but then you talked about it being, it, it had a formal government process attached to it and I and, and, and alarm bells started to ring for me because it started to sound like a legitimization of unsolicited proposals and I'm thinking the Crown proposal at Barangaroo which was a great idea for some people but not for others. I'm thinking about the 16,000 dwellings that Andrew Constance talked about for the Bayes Precinct which he probably thought was a very great idea but a lot of us don't and I'm just worried about Mervac having some great ideas and, and <laughs> Meriden having some great ideas and, and there being great ideas which are, at the end of the day are really unsolicited proposals so I'd like some clarification on that. Thank you. Do you want to take that second, second question first? Yeah. David? Uh, yes. First, uh, the process, it, and the, the uh, words that I use of a, a, a legitimate government process is the thing, uh, Rochelle, about uh, open and transparent processes, they are. And so others, apart from th this community, will have an opportunity to have a great idea. And so the process will be uh, available to all, but it will be strongly um, governed by guidelines and assessment criteria and a process that guarantees appropriate treatment of each of them. So we're not going to uh, uh, legitimise unsolicited proposals. We're actually seeking great ideas from whoever wants to give us one. And it might not suit you that, that Meriton have an idea, but they might have. But the reality of it is that you cannot have a transparent, open public process unless everybody's allowed to participate. And so that's what it's, that, that part of it's about. Uh, does that answer that? It actually raises more concerns that um, it actually might actually find a great concern. Well, again, uh, there's an assumption that in reading that uh, we're starting planning on the 30th of September, <coughs> none of this is, as Alex quite rightly pointed out, these are um, milestones of things that we want to start or to get to and to start. They're not um, end points for discussion or communication. In fact, far from it. They're just operational, issue, uh, operational milestones that we need to get to so that we can continue this process. There's no thought whatsoever 
to get to the 30th of September and, and just stop communicating. In fact, the opposite is exactly the case. But we do have to, I mean, the notion of the, by the 30th of September, we'd like to have put in place an understanding of what the planning process would be that's undertaken. And we need to negotiate with other government agencies and, uh, and other partners, the councils, your council and the city of Sydney. And so that's what's that about. It, it's a milestone of achieving understandings. It's not about stopping to communicate. And you know, what I've heard tonight, and the lady from Balmain, who ask, you know, when are we going to start um, uh, asking for your views? Well, that's what tonight's all about. We, we're not here um, to ask your views on the paper tonight. We've, we've revealed it to you. Uh, it's, been re it's been released today to a range of stakeholders, but you're amongst the first to get it. And wh that's what it's about. We want to hear what your ideas are about what's in the paper and what uh, we put up as, as uh, uh, propositions. And so it's the start of a, of a process. It's certainly not the finish of it. Yeah, Julia? Just a point of clarification, I, I think in relation to the call for great ideas that needs to be conveyed, it is not a procurement process. The call for great ideas is about genuinely getting great ideas to then inform the final transformation plan in August. So it, it, the fear that you might have that this is actually a procurement process is not correct. It is a genuine call for intellectual property to help government understand the possibilities of what could be done from a number of different stakeholders to help inform our planning for this precinct. Uh, lady in the pink. Thank you. More remain. I'm representing the Nature Conservation Council Planning Committee. Um, sustainability. I'm sure it's all underpinning a lot of your thinking, but I don't see it articulated. I don't see ecological sustainability coming through. The cliche of design excellence has to be has to be overturned, and you need something that talks about buildings being absolutely 21st century your models of sustainability. I mean, if you if you think about um, CUB, for example, uh, how, how can you drive high-level green performance in, in the whole area? I mean, for example, from a biodiversity point of view, you can have green roofs, and yet that also addresses the heat island problem, uh, or starts to. I mean, I, I really think you should be demanding a much higher uh, performance standard on, its, on the green credentials. Uh, can I respond by saying uh, I couldn't agree with you more I was the chief executive of the city of Melbourne when, and Matt Plumridge, who's here with me tonight, uh, when we built Council House 2, which at that stage was the first ever six-star green building in the world. So I'm committed to this more than you'll ever know. It's in my DNA and I'm going to drive the hell out of it. Oh, yeah. Yep, we, we, we are articulating it. You read it in the paper, you, in, in this discussion paper, you listen to what we say all over the place, you say it's not coming through. I could not agree less. Okay, well that might be your view on it, but design excellence is, is, is not just about, um, well, the, the excellence of design comes right through. Now you might see it's a cliche, but if it, you don't have excellent design, you're not gonna get the elements that you talked about. Okay, right. I'll just commit to it. How about that? <laughs> Excellent. Yes. You still going? <laughs> uh, Leslie Lynch uh, from the Glebe Society and a fairly lengthy history um, around the Bose precinct. Uh, Rochelle stole uh, my both of my points, actually, but I'm going to come from a slightly different uh, angle and say thank you for the consultation and, yeah, I think you're probably trying very hard around this and this is a good step. But after a speed read, and that's obviously all it's been, a speed read of the transformation document you've given us and the overheads, all, almost all of it sounds great, almost all of it resonates with things that have been said in lots of places. But I don't really know how we're going to respond to it um, because it, it also leaves you with a sense that we actually don't know anything that you're actually thinking behind it. 
It, we don't know anything. There's, it's almost like there's a whole lot of back stuff, if you like, tangibles or tangible conversations about options, which aren't there. And because they're not there, um, well, yeah, yeah, it's, it, a lot of it sounds nice. So given I need to ask you a question, um, maybe the question is, uh, could you give us a sense of what, what has actually gone to government at this stage in formal ways? Um, are there you know, broad kinds of proposals floating around, or well, no, tangible proposals which would fit into these areas? Uh, if you send me, but it's, I seriously don't know how we respond. Is there, are we actually missing any of the current backstory? Not where you're going to get to later. The answer is no. Um, these propositions that we've put to you tonight about the seven destinations and the three time frames, we've put those to government for direction as to whether they see that as the appropriate way to go. It's been uh, accepted in principle and we've been uh, authorised by government to roll this out to you to, to see what you think about it. And it's clear that there are some people who are in favour of it and some people who are not, and that's not surprising. But there's no secret deals here. This is all a very open process. Uh, what we've told the government, we're telling you. And uh, I don't understand, I can understand how you might feel as though you haven't been involved in the process, because what we've done is put and we need to get, I needed, and the organisation needed to get direction from government as to what they saw as acceptable in terms of propositions. And we've been, they've told us that they like these propositions and we're putting them to you for your ideas. So my, um, uh, my uh, suggestion to you, Dr Lynch, is you take these as bona fide um, uh, proposals and tell us what you think. Gentleman over there, thank you. Hi, uh, Mark Wallace, resident of Roselle and member of Roselle Iron Cove Precinct. Um, I understand with a, a project this large, you've got to start somewhere, and it sounds like that's what you're going to do. But my question is, before you proceed, even with these early elements, um, will you have overall targets for the whole site? Will you have a plan for the complete site? And my concern is that some of the largest land elements are being left out of this early stage because of factors outside of your control, like the railway goods yards and, uh, and Glebe Island. Um, the, the problem is that we might end up incrementally losing some of the access to public land, uh, and or we end up with much greater housing targets you know, maybe up around the 16,000 mark as was proposed last year. I know it was denied, but that we may end up with, with much higher housing targets if we don't know exactly what we're dealing with in the early stages. So my question is, will there be overall targets released for the whole of the Bay's precinct before you proceed with these early elements? The answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that we've, we've uh, made these recommendations because the four elements that we've talked about in the, uh, in the early phase, uh, they are possible for us to interact with and, and generate outcomes, but in the other areas, it's not possible for us to do that at this point. And Mark, the question, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, you've got to start somewhere, and that's the process that we're going to boldly go for, but we're going to consult the hell out of it, uh, and that's part of tonight. But the, the, the other side of what you just put to, and I understand your concerns about it, but from where I sit, if we hold back until we get all of that absolute definition that you've asked for, we'll be at the same place that every other attempt to do the bays has been at. So we can spend the next year, you, uh, uh, Professor Marceau said, you've been, you've been on this for nearly 10 years. If we go your route, we'll be in the same place in another 10 years. So what we're going to do is to boldly have a go at the elements that can be activated, and, and that's my answer. Yes, gentlemen in the grey. Um, Damien Hawcroft from the Bayes Community Coalition. First of all, thanks very much for tonight. I think it, it's a good start, so thank you. Um, secondly, what I'd like to say is that on the 7th of June at Leichhardt Town Hall, we're having a, a people's meeting 
to hear what people have to say about the bay and what they, they desire for the bay. So I'd like uh, to, um, to uh, pass on an invitation to Urban Growth. They're most welcome to attend, to sit back and to listen. That would be really great. I think uh, from an outsider's point of view, it's more of a statement, David, but I think uh, one of the concerns, the apprehension or the scepticism is the fact that um, the, if you look at the 16 executives of urban growth, 90% come from a development um, property investment banking background. I don't want to say any more, but I think that's where scepticism begins. And I think um, if we're looking into the future, you were saying how do we sort of break down this communication improve it between the community and urban growth, etc. I think it's getting rid of that scepticism. I don't have the answer, but I think that's where we're a good place to start. So thank you. Okay, well, if I can respond to the last bit and thank you for the invitation. We'll be there. Um, uh, can you make certain we know about those? 7th of June and it's Leichhardt in the evening, is it? Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to the um, your uh, well, I, I suppose it's a, it's a perspective that um, my uh, management team is overblown with, what did you say, development-based people? Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah, I can understand why you would see that as a concern, but the reality of it is we are dealing with um, this government land in ways that need to be done, uh, sorry, that need to be planned in terms of really great outcomes. And one of, one of the instructions that I have under our mandate is to, uh, is to be very uh, astute uh, in terms of the projects we do, to make certain that taxpayers' money is used in the most efficient way possible, and to build, uh, if we build, we build things that are viable and further the, the state's economy overall. Th that is one of the overriding things and therefore I need people who know how to do these things. That doesn't mean that our plan is all about developing every aspect of the bays. Uh, it's not. It, and th uh, there's a massive amount of commitment amongst my group to actually do this right. And it's in their bloodstream, believe me Danny, it is in our thinking that we want to do this in the, in the, in the most uh, productive way possible and to create a great, great space for Sydney. And I understand why you would think that, but I, all I can say to you is we don't think that way. You can say that we're all developers, but we're not. There's a lot of us that have got multi-skills and in, in some areas there are people who have got direct skills. So I can understand your point, but I'll just put a different perspective, please. Further questions? Yes, lady in second row. Um, Kath Hacking, Bayes Co Coalition. Um, I'm concerned about the growth of shipping uh, in the different bays. For instance, the super yacht marina continues to expand. How can we arrange or uh, prepare a promenade in that area? Uh, um, right. uh, yeah. It is growing daily. Every few days we see another super yacht in the bay. Um, I know that it will be awkward for you to uh, terminate leases or get clearance of leases, but this one has been approved and, and is growing. Thank you very much. With regards to all the, the land holdings, whether it be in Rosehill Bay or whether it be um, further around in Blackwater Bay, we're working with our, our agency partners to determine great outcomes for urban renewal. Now, there are some compatible uses, and there's, there's opportunities for compatible uses, both maritime and public access. Maybe not every day of the week, maybe only sometimes you know, when non-ship days. And the prime example is when you look at the uh, International Cruise Terminal in a uh, circular key. When there's a non-boat day, you can run via the water. When there's a boat in, you go around the back. One of those things is the, the short-term medium options. The other one is actually working with the tenant to see how we can improve access for the public in that area. And obviously the final options is, yes, we look at all of the scenarios of 
land use and compatibility for that purpose. So it's a very broad answer and we need to consider all those options. Could, could I just uh, say that I understand how you'd, you know, you'd feel about this, but our determination is to get there somehow, to find a way to develop this over the 10 to 15 years that we might need to do it. And I, I hope like hell we can do it much quicker, but we will tr try to find a way to do it and to work through these difficulties. We, we've got a, a very strong proposition being put to um, the executive of uh, Roads and Maritime Services. We've now got an operating group with Transport for New South Wales and also um, we've entered into with Simon and, and Paul and, and team entered into negotiations and discussions about how the current leaseholders might be asked to do their leaseholding in different ways. So we are, are trying to do this. I know what you mean. I was out on the bays the other day uh, with some people from the UK and there's a a, a, a bloody great big thing that sticks right out in the middle of the bay. I understand um, uh, the, the concerns about it. We are negotiating to try to do something about the promenade, but I, I won't make, uh, uh, make one made like of how difficult it's going to be, but we are going to try and find a way. Sorry, just wait for the microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry. We are being shut out already. Uh, the cruise terminal will let the, re, uh, the residents through when there is not a ship in port. We can't use that walk area along the foreshore there if there's a ship in port. I do understand that. Um, and it's a matter of trying to get um, uh, a, a, new, a, a new paradigm into the thinking there so that we can actually see what we might be able to do to make it different. Simon mentioned that it was uh, a great success in, in our view in, in, in the number of people who came down to have a look at the, at the, uh, uh, at the access uh, on Discovery Day and there's uh, some people who have been critical of it but the great thing about it is that a lot of people from all over, the, uh, all over Sydney and other places understand that it's there and, it, it, and just what a great thing it would be. So we are on it. Further questions? Yes. Uh, Gretchen Gamble, Annandale Precinct Base Coalition, and uh, also m I and uh, members of my family are all members of um, hockey clubs, soccer clubs, uh, swimming clubs, athletic clubs. Um, currently there's a deficit of some seven playing fields in our municipality. Um, that takes up a fair bit of room. By the time 16,000 or whatever the number's going to be, extra people come to live in the area, it's going to be um, many times more than that. Um, I didn't note that there was any sort of particular mention of large areas for playing fields or for indoor centres or even for something to do with um, arts and drama. I'm just wondering, uh, is that in the mix there somewhere? And if so, where? And in the interim, uh, we have the wasteland currently known as Roselle Rail Yards sitting there in the midst of our suburb. And I know that our council and the various sporting bodies would more th be more than happy to actually take care of that on behalf of the government, because the government, after all, is looking after our own public land, which we all own, it manages. And I'm sure our council, Rochelle, would help look after those lands and we can, in the interim, use the lovely flat expanse that is a wasteland overgrown, rusted tins, a whole lot, to develop in the interim because you say it's going to be at least uh, 10 years till you require that land at the rail yards. Um, can we have it in the meantime to create some sporting fields, please, for an area that is known to be uh, the most densely populated with the least amount of open space per child in the entire um, country? Thank you. I'll take, no, I'll take that. Um, one of the things that one of the kids said to us at the, um, the Leadership Summit for Schools today was in relation to uh, this, and it's a very similar comment, but what she said was, when I explained to her that why we're not dealing with it at the moment, because it's a process that's beyond our control, but we are trying to influence that process, she said, well, why don't you make it into a bushwalk until you need it? 
And you know, I thought, well, wow, what a great idea. So we'll take your idea on board and just to see whether or not it can be utilised in, in the meantime. But I'm not in control of the land at this point. But I, I, I hear what you say. Now, in relation to the uh, development of playing fields elsewhere, we are looking at how we might be able to incorporate mixed use um, uh, playing fields as opposed to dedicated uh, playing fields because we've got, we're probably not going to have enough space. Like uh, the, the, uh, the goalie, in the 72-year-old goalie from the uh, Balmain uh, Soccer Club said they need 27 soccer pitches. Uh, I don't think we can deliver 27 soccer pitches and then three hockey fields and all of that sort of stuff. So whatever we do, all of us are going to have to get smart about what the, the mixed use of stadia um, uh, might be in the area. But we are very concerned about this. And I mentioned to David, who's no longer with us, uh, that's the wrong way to put that, <laughs> David, who's had to leave. Yeah, he's gone home. Yeah, good on him. Um, but uh, what we are looking to do is to get smarter with the provision of uses. And one of the things that there will need to be schools and facilities for, for kids, but those kids, when they don't need to use them, uh, the community can. And we've got a really strong model. We've had done some really, really interesting and deep research into Scandinavia as to how we're looking at to do that there. So uh, we he hear what you say and we're gonna, we'll try and do something about it.